what's fascinating, and, and I like talking to um, um, non-Asian people about Asian things, because it helps me reflect on my own life and my own choices and my own interests, right? So in here, I'm, I, you know, I try and talk about the transformative nature of experience. And but before we get to that, the nature of the transformation within us, I'd like to always, you know, see about how does a, a, a white guy from Canada end up like feeling propelled and compelled to pursue uh, things Chinese? Well, you see, it's so cold here that we just go toward where there, where it's not cold. And Shanghai That's was less cold. But um, to give you a, a more true answer to that, um, when I was a, a young child, um, I was a fairly weak child. And uh, I was not in the best physical shape. So at school, they would have me um, go to a remedial class every day during kindergarten and grade one, where I would actually walk a straight line. That was one of the classes that I had to take every day. Wow. And uh, so I was really uncoordinated. But as, um, as a young person, um, I got really fascinated by the Ninja Turtles. So you know, legit 1980s kids, right? And so seeing the, the Ninja Turtles, I, of course, I wanted to study ninjutsu. And we did have a ninjutsu teacher in the, the town I grew up in, in Guelph, Ontario, um, which is like a hop, skip and a jump away from Toronto to, you know, give people a geographical idea of where it is. Yeah. Um, and uh, so my parents took me out to see the different martial arts classes where I was at that time. You know, we had a lot of family martial arts schools. So there was, you know, a ninjutsu guy, a jujitsu guy, karate guys, and so on and so forth. Um, even a bit of kung fu. But basically, what it boiled down to is that uh, when I went to a bunch of the schools, they kind of scared me because I was a bit of a timid kid. So I ended up going into to Goju Ryu Karate because that was the school that we found that seemed like the most sort of nice place, suitable place, nice teachers, nice classmates. And uh, so I hung out in the, in the martial arts world as a kid. Um, but as a teenager, I, I got myself into all kinds of trouble. I um, was, I was pretty badly bullied in school. And uh, so in high school, I had some coping me mechanisms that I was using that put me into the wrong crowds and, you know, put me in like the party scene and so on and so forth. And I came out of the other end of that at about 20 years old, pretty damaged. And so um, what had happened was that um, I was mentally not very healthy. And uh, my, my mother was concerned about me. And she said, Hey, listen, um, I study this thing called Qigong, which is, you know, sort of tangential to what you used to do in martial arts. Why don't you come along and check it out? And so I did. And uh, after the first class, um, there it was this really nice teacher named Michelle McMillan, who uh, is, a, is a very serious Buddhist practitioner too. And somehow that practice was able to lead me into mental stillness and physical comfort. And I, so I came out of that first class thinking, wow, I'm going to do this for the rest of my life. And incidentally, <laughs> so far it's, turned out to be true. Um, so that attracted me to, to these arts, but I wanted to practice seriously. And at the same time, my dad hold, had all these martial arts books lying around the house, like, you know, uh, BK Francis, the power of the internal arts and, and so on and so forth. Right. And so I looked at all of those and all the Zheng Manqing Tai Chi books. And uh, I thought, yeah, wow, like I got to study Bagua. That was what I thought I should should study. Well, you know, I'm short and stocky. It's not really the art for me. But I looked around for a Bagua teacher, and uh, I went to Toronto, and I met a few people there, and, you know, uh, they were fine, but it wasn't what I was looking for. And then uh, I met this dude. Uh, that's not... I met my teacher, who was <laughs> named... Yeah, and uh, he um, he's based in Montreal, so I went and studied with him. Uh, it happened to be that my teacher, uh, my sister was living there um, for university, so she would leave in the summer to go home. And so I'd go live in her place in the summer and study with Master Young. And I did that for about um, five years. And then at some point he said to me, listen, you know, if you want to understand this stuff on a level that's deeper than just physical, you should probably spend some time in China. So um, I happened to get an opportunity to go live in Shanghai um, as part of an exchange trip. Well, 
actually it was just a it wasn't really an exchange trip it was just like an overseas study trip that was organized by the University of Guelph and uh, I stayed there for a few years I, I worked at the university uh, OCTCM there and uh, you know, got into further into martial arts culture and tea culture and and eventually uh, Taoist culture as well. So that's kind of the story in a nutshell. Huh. Oh, my gosh. So we, we need to just back up a little bit. So your mother was taking Qigong classes and your father had karate or martial art books around the house. So a little bit of a parallel. My my father. Um, studied acupuncture. He was a, he was an osteopathic physician. He passed away a bunch of years ago, but he studied uh, acupuncture, took courses at the first acupuncture school in the U S here. And he had acupuncture books on his bookshelf. My mother was a psychologist and a hippie at one point before that. And she had books on Buddhism and the Tao Te Ching on her bookshelf. He was my stepfather. So when they met and those two things were on the shared shelves, um, that was part of kind of just seeing that with that for me. And for you, it seems like a similar thing. They didn't really, my, he didn't practice acupuncture. He couldn't reconcile Western medicine and acupuncture theory, but he, he did two, three, 10 day retreats to do my, uh, to do uh, meditation with uh, Mahesh Yogi. The, and, um, and um, my mother, my mother was just a psycho, you know, a psychotherapist, but the books were there and that influenced me. But how did your parents then get into Qigong and martial arts? And is that what brought them together? Or did they find them together? I don't think so. Um, I, I think that the story is uh, my dad, when he was a kid, he was, when he was a, a young adult, um, he worked for the government of Canada for a time uh, doing electronic repair on on ship on boats um and also you know electronic stuff for cartography tours um up north and so he was exposed to a lot of different cultural forms and uh early on one of the things that he was exposed to was jujitsu and so um after studying jujitsu he had an appreciation for the martial arts and when i was a kid because i wanted to study karate that at that school the teacher whose name is jim kelsch um, really, really great guy, very, you know, foundational in my thinking, actually. Um, he was also teaching Taiji. And so my dad would study Taiji with, uh, with Sensei Kelch, um, you know, so a few days a week. And uh, as a result of that, that's how the book collection got built up. Um, he still does uh, Taiji secretly uh, at midnight every night after everybody else in the house is asleep. Um, I, cause when I was living with them, um, while we were looking for a new house, I'd, I'd get up sometimes and I'd see him out there wearing his bathrobe, you know, looking like the dude doing his Taiji on one leg stuff. And, uh, and he, he also secretly does some kata, you know, and, and push-ups against the wall. Um, my, uh, so I know he's still into it. He just, he's just, uh, hides it. My mother, um, when she was pregnant with my sister, so I have a little sister who's five years younger than me, but unfortunately, like a hundred years smarter than me. Um, not good for the sibling rivalry thing on my end, but um, you know. So when she was pregnant with my sister, she had terrible edema, um, like you know, swollen legs, right? And so she um, went to try out a, a Taiji class with the you know the Taoist Taiji people. It's a Canadian organization. I think it was run by a person named Moi Lin Shin, who, you know, sadly is, has passed uh, in the 90s. But um, so anyway, when she did that, her edema went away immediately. And so she was really sold on on, on Taiji. But um, she ended up becoming uh, part of another school with this teacher, Michelle McMillan, who I mentioned. And I think the reason is because Michelle's emphasis was on Qigong, which is very healing and, you know, nurturing. And so um, it was better for what my, my mom was looking for. And so that's kind of the, the genesis of that. It didn't have anything to do with how they met. But, you know, at the same time, um, you can say it's sort of a, a, sub, a subplot inside the family story, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Now, um, you speak fluent Mandarin, correct? Um. You know, it's funny because there's gradations of fluency, right? So I can I can do everything that I need to do if I'm living in China. But I realized because when I was, I guess, in my early 30s, I, I kind of had this idea that I was really good at it. And then after a certain amount of time, I realized that 
once you learn a language up to a certain level of fluency where you can survive, then there's the cultural stuff. And that's the stuff that's actually hard to learn. And so I would say that my, my Chinese is good enough to get by, um, but my reading is a lot better than my speaking. Yeah, and speaking and and speaking of the reading, you you do quite a bit of translation of, of Qigong texts, is that correct? Yeah, so um, for the past decade approximately, um, I've, I've been learning to read classical Chinese um, as well as modern Chinese as well. But um, what what the genesis of that is, um, was that I wanted to learn meditation from, from my teacher, uh, Haiyang. And he said, you know, for Taoist stuff, um, you can't do it without having theoretical knowledge. It's not the same as martial arts. You can't just pick it up right out of the box. And so he would sit down with me and read these classical documents, like, you know, understanding reality or, you know, there's, there's tons and tons of different documents in Taoism. And uh, eventually I got the idea that, hey, you know, if I'm, if I go to China frequently, why don't I just learn to do it myself? And so um, while I was studying Chinese at East China Normal University, I started reading the Tao Te Ching. And it took a year to, to read the whole thing. Like I was keeping really exhaustive notes about it, right? But um, after a year, I'd read the whole text. And then I started reading meditation documents. And so I would go back and visit my teacher. And I'd be like, hey, look, this is my interpretation of these documents. And he'd be like, wrong, 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 wrong. And so we'd go back through them. And he showed me how to read the, the code in the documents. So wow. I spent about, about a decade um, exclusively reading uh, internal alchemy documents. Which, in, internal alchemy is one genre inside of Taoist meditation practice. And then more recently, I've been kind of um, bridging out into other genres, so other parts of Taoism, Chinese medicine, modern Qigong, a uh, little bit of Buddhism, Confucianism, and that kind of stuff. But um, my main background is in Taoist documents. That's quite impressive for a, uh, a slow learning white guy. As, as you're starting out, like you're saying, and now you speak Chinese, you read Chinese, you translate Chinese, you do martial arts and study tea. I mean, that's quite a, that's quite a transformation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, the thing is, you, you find the things that you like in life, you find the things that you have aptitude for, and uh, you can't do everything, right? But what you can do, if you, if you enjoy it, if you're passionate about it, then it can actually create you. Let's talk about... Um, Taoist text for a moment. So you're talking about there's different levels. There's philosophy, there's religion, there's internal alchemy, there's magic. There's Can you kind of break down those uh, categories a little bit and talk about each one in, in like a snapshot? Sure. I mean, this is going to be tremendously prejudiced because it's coming from my own perspective. But, of course. Um, but so when, when you look at Taoism as a genre, um, there's a whole bunch of different schools of thought. And so... Um, what we can broadly say is that his, historically, so actually it's interesting, my university background is in history. So I graduated actually from, from the history program at Guelph. And so that's one of the ways that I like to look at these documents is to make a uh, historical analysis of them to understand them. So historically, when you look at the first Taoist documents, um, they were philosophical in nature. And I know that there's an intense discussion in, in the Taoist academic world about whether or not it's accurate to say that they were philosophical. But the, the position that I take is that basically um, for around 500 years in China, from sometime around 600 BC to about, you know, give or take 100 BC, um, there was this really intense philosophical discussion surrounding government. And um, it was because China at that time was a bunch of small states that were all contending with each other to, you know, see who could become the boss. And so you had these different players like, um, you know, the, the Ruists, right, who are, you know, Confucius and his people, um, who were trying to instantiate, you know, sort of a public morality system that could be supportive so that if government wasn't going too well, at least you could have a, a public morality to support society while government was going off the rails. Um, on the other hand, the Taoists, they were, they were another group of people who were looking at things from the perspective of, of the elite. So the Taoists were saying, hey, look, if you're a government official, um, what should you do to make sure that the people are well taken care of and do it in such a way that you, know, you don't end up with um, an overbearing uh, sort of tyrannical approach to governing society, right? 
And then there were other groups too, like, you know, the Moists who were about um, helping weak countries defend themselves against strong countries and so on and so forth, right? It's just a nutshell or like a overhead view, right? But um, eventually what happened is that Taoism um, became merged with local religious beliefs of the various different places that it was happening in. So um, when we look at Taoism today, there's a common um, bivalence where some people prefer this older philosophical rationale of Taoism, and some people prefer this um, sort of like post-1 AD approach to Taoism, which has um, you know many different deities and different religious practices. Um, so typically we would say that the big two categories of Taoism from a modern perspective in, in China are called Dao Jia and Dao Jiao. So Dao Jia means the, the Taoist philosophy school and Dao Jiao means the Taoist religion. And in, in modern times, we kind of retroactively look at Taoism and think about it in that way. Um, but even within that genre, um, what I'm more interested in personally is a third thing, which is called Xiu Dao or Xiu Lian. Um, Xiu means to to repair, and Dao means like the the way or the path. Or uh, Lian can mean to to refine something. So Xiu Lian means to repair and refine, um, or self cultivation, right? So that's sort of the third approach to to Taoism, which can be ensconced within a philosophical view or religious view. Um, but what it's about is um, basically viewing the body and the mind as a holistic continuum and trying to take care of yourself so that you um, become healthier physically and mentally and you become an improved person in society. <laughs> I, think, I think most Westerners think of Taoism as a philosophy. You know, they, they, don't, really dis they don't distinguish because they're not really that um, educated uh, about the differences. And I think a lot of, and it's just my opinion, uh, I, or my perspective is that I think a lot of Western practitioners of Taoist arts are looking towards self-cultivation, not the religion uh, so much. So Tai Chi and and uh, Qigong and uh, meditation uh, kind of a practice. I know that's where mine is, as well as reading the translated texts, uh, which, you know, are anything translated, especially in English with our, our poor language. Um, they're not really giving you the essence of what you're reading. Um, do you compare texts sometimes that you might translate versus somebody's published work and be like, wow, there's a whole piece here that makes the premise incorrect because the word, the choice of the translated characters changes a meaning? Well, you know, that's a really interesting and also very kind of hot button question, but I'll do my best. Um, so the the situation with translation of of Taoist documents is that there's multiple generations and so we have this the very oldest generation is like the James Legg um yeah. you know Dao De Jing which is um it's written sort of like um sort of like a lyrical poem which actually isn't that far away from how classical chinese writing is because in the old days classical chinese writing was written in very you know, austere, specific sort of formulations of characters, like four characters or five characters or seven characters. And they would have to have certain kinds of intonations and stuff in them to be grammatically correct. But um, those early translations of Taoist documents um, are a good first try, let's say. And then what you get around the 70s is, um, or even a little bit earlier, let's say during the, the 40s, um, you get, you know, people like, um, who is it? Was it Wilhelm? Who, who was working together with Carl Jung. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. You get the Wilhelm Jung kind of approach to things, which, um, you know, perhaps it picks up a little bit of Jung's philosophy of the mind. And so, you know, in some ways it kind of deviates from uh, perhaps what the original document said. And then a bit later in the 70s, you get this whole proliferation of different people, some of whom are translating things like um, uh, Stephen Mitchell, right? M Mitchell? Mitchell? Yeah, it's like Thomas Cleary. Cleary, that's right. Cleary, that was the name that I was thinking of. Yeah. And and also people maybe who are more involved in the cultural end of things like Alan Watts. Right. And, right. Uh, you know, they the way that I view it is there's a there's an evolution of, of ideas. 
And I don't think that even today we've got it completely right. Um, our academics today are very, very good um, at, at translation. Mm. And so if you look at today's sinologists, um, or you know, you look at people like Livia Cohn, they're very accurate. They have very good footnotes. Um, but then the issue with, with Taoism is that um, Taoism is something which traditionally, um, if you do practices associated with Tao, so you do meditation or Qigong or whatever, it's traditionally imparted from teacher to student. Right. And so without that oral transmission, it's very hard to understand some fine points of the documents. Um, and I had a conversation with my teacher yesterday on the phone where he completely flipped me for a 180, maybe a, maybe a 90 degree flip actually, um, about my understanding of some of the finer points of internal alchemy documents. And this is after, you know, well over a decade of studying this stuff with him. And so one of the th issues that translators face is that um, you can get the basic correct translation as long as you're properly educated in, in reading Chinese, but getting the the finer sort of hidden material inside of it can be difficult. And so I would say that when I look at my own work, I have to also admit that um, I'm nowhere near as good as these people who spend, you know, a decade doing a PhD in Chinese literature in terms of being accurate, but in terms of having um, information which is passed down through, through a tradition, um, you know, I think that maybe people like me have a strong point compared to people who just go through the universities. So I don't want to say either that I think that they're inaccurate or accurate or that I'm inaccurate or accurate, but instead that we have different strengths and weaknesses relative to our backgrounds. Do you think that um, arts like uh, Tai Chi, Xingyi Bagua, Luha Bafa, Qigong, that they really come from Wudang Mountain and from Taoist, or is that just branding? Well, that's that's two questions rolled into one. So if 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 they're Taoists or if they're from Wudang should be two questions. And so um, if we say are they Taoist or not, then we have to have a working definition of Taoism. And this is something that is hotly contested in the West right now. It doesn't seem to be a problem in China, <laughs> but it's hotly contested in the West. And um, you know, there's a bunch of there, I've I've considered writing books about this in the past, because it's a very interesting topic. But to give the most, uh, I'll give my opinion rather than rather than all of the facts that support my opinion. Um, basically, when we talk about Taoism, we need to get out of the perspective of viewing Taoism as a discrete tradition, and instead, we should view it as a as a cultural phenomenon. And so when we say is Taiji Chuan a Taoist art, then we need to understand what is it that Taoism does as a cultural phenomenon? And if you, I think if you make an overview of Taoism, the conclusion you would come to is, it's a school of thought that teaches you how to do things naturally so that you live in a more effortlessly and more liberate, more effortless and liberated way. And so in that case, then Taiji Chuan, it has a very strong Taoist influence because the idea of the practice is to make you natural and supple and relaxed and, you know, like a child, right? But then at the same time, there's also a lot of things imported from Taoism, like the idea of the Dantian, the elixir field. Um, the way that Taiji people use the Dantian and the way the meditators use the Dantian is completely different. They're not even remotely connected, but it's still the same place in the body. And it's still the basic same idea. So we can say definitely, yeah, those are Taoist, at least Taoist influenced arts. Um, they don't necessarily belong to the Taoist religion, but you know we already discussed the you know the complexities of that. Um, Wudang, on the other hand, that's that's a nebulous and, and difficult question. And I have a lot of good friends who are you know Wudang temple uh, initiates, so I don't want to step on anybody's toes. Right. But I will say that in the early part of the 20th century, and then in the later part of the 20th century, there were um, some very good martial arts historians. So Kang Go Wu is one of them. And uh, they pretty much proved that Wudang doesn't have any connection to, to Taiji Chuan before the 20th century. So um, the traditional story is that Taiji was created by Jiang Sanfeng, who was a, a Taoist immortal at Wudang. Jiang Sanfeng actually is a really interesting character. I, I actually taught uh, about 30% of his internal alchemy syllabus uh, earlier this year. 
uh, to a group online. And he was, he made a lot of good documents for, for meditation and for the Taoist religion, but he probably didn't have anything to do with martial arts. Um, I think the common story is that Taiji probably originated with a person named Chen Wanting, who was uh, a senior member of the, the Chen family in, in Chen village, Henan. And uh, actually, I lived in Henan for, for a number of years, right down the street from Chen village. Um, if you go to that area, they have very, very good yam. It's this little thin yam. And if you eat it, you, um, you become sexually excited. I thought you were going to say immortal, but sexually excited is better. So Wudang, you know, it's, but the thing about Wudang, right, is that um, they have a very, very good background in Taoism in terms of being involved in it for hundreds of years. Um, what I would say is that there's um, a very good connection in the 20th century, um, which can help you understand how Northern Chinese martial arts like Bagua and Xinyi and Taiji came to Wudang. And uh, the, the main person who taught those arts at Wudang, his name was Fu Jinqiu. Mm. Um, and uh, I actually met his grandson um, in a train in Hubei province one time. Very, very nice guy, very humble. And it's it's hard to imagine that his his grandfather's, you know, Xingyi practice is super famous at Wudang, but he's just in the countryside doing his thing with, you know, maybe his 20 or 30 disciples. Um, in some way, it seems kind of unfair to me. But we know that this happened because it was, it was well recorded. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is the, I think that for people who practice Taiji at Wudang, and they're really serious, then what they should do is concede that their practice is part of a religious narrative and that they can accept it on the level of belief because their chosen belief is Taoism, but that they should respect the, the real recorded history as well. Yeah, I agree with that. There's a lot of uh, myth building or we call um, creation myths about all religions and martial arts are like religion. So every martial art has a creation myth, creation founder. It's got to all lead to one. You know, like every art having to lead back to Shaolin. I mean, it's just insane. <laughs> Chang Sang Feng, a lot of people say that he's mythical and not a real guy, or like the Yellow Emperor, it's 20 guys with one name and et cetera. But you're saying there's actual texts under his name, right? Um, my understanding is that he was a real person who I think lived uh, probably like around 1100 AD. But the the thing that complicates it is that after he, you know, stopped being on the earth, or perhaps, you know, who knows, right? One story is that he flew away, another story is that he went under the ground, right? So um, when he stopped being a mortal human, then um, he became deified. And so during the, the Ming dynasty, um, which was, you know, until about, I think, uh, the late 1600s or early 1700s, um, Zhang San Feng was was treated as a as a deity within sort of even the the official government doctrine, and so what that meant is that people who wanted to make certain claims would say that they were Zhang San Feng. So you can imagine that then this guy is seen all over the place, maybe even today, right? right. And, and then it, it's further obscured by the fact that sometimes in in China, when people have a new idea. Um, traditional Chinese culture is not so amenable to making a claim by yourself. So you have to say that you were taught by somebody who's very famous. Right. So with these people who created different schools of meditation, they might say, you know, um, I was fishing and uh, wouldn't you know it, Zhang San Feng rode by on a boat made of bamboo and gourds and he stopped and he wrote me a little alchemical text and this is what I'm giving to you now. So that's one of the reasons why it might seem, oh, this person is sort of an amalgam of different people. But in reality, there is a, a historical claim that, that Zhang actually was a real person. Mm, very interesting. So I think you and I need to talk about publishing a book on that. You writing, me publishing uh, on the historical real person and on the translated documents. I think that will be quite a worthwhile task. Yeah, great. I have a big database of them on my computer. So uh, wonderful. Um, and, you know, that. That, that story that you just said about him coming by and you having to have a teacher, you see it in India, in the Hindu traditions, the, the 
it's Mahavatar Babaji has appeared to everybody and all these past gurus and swamis have appeared to everybody to give them the teachings. It makes the researching very difficult and finding, you know, truth very difficult, which is why I think, and I'm going to ask your opinion on this, is that relying on older original texts for Taoism and Buddhism and meditation is better. Well, you're certainly giving me a great uh, chance to, you know, play my own horn. But um, but, I heard you wrote a book. What's that? I I I I know that you wrote a book. Ah, yes. Alchemy. I believe that I did. Classic text. Yes, yes. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, It's it's not a secret. Um, Mark uh, uh, helped me get my career on the road. Um, He his uh, Tambuli published uh, Internal Alchemy Cultivation: The Nature of Taoist Meditation, which is uh, you know a very good, uh, easy to read book about internal alchemy that can get you started. And it does have actually uh, some translation in it. Mm-hmm. Um, it's got the Lu, Lu Dongbin's 100 character uh, ancestor stele. Um, but, you know, so the question about um, should we read old documents, right? Um, I think that it's important to get some some context about specifically about Taoism. And I'm sure other traditions are like this too, but um, I've only, you know, flirted with other traditions. I really put all my effort into into Taoism. Um, so in Taoism, there's a there's a canon, and the canon is called Dao Zang, um, which just means like the Zang means a, a container. So the the container of Taoist documents, and the canon is technically a religious canon, but there are different sections of it, and so all the different books that you can think of in Taoism are within this canon. And depending what you're interested in, you might choose to read different things. So some people read books about writing talismans, for instance, and they do magic um, or, or, or talismanic medicine. And some people, you know, they like, uh, you know, various types of ritual or, or chants and stuff like that. Um, if you're from a religious lineage, you, you might have a very particular view of how you read the documents, but um the key point is that the knowledge is contained there. And so you have to some, to some extent, you have to read documents and not every Taoist school is the same. There's some Taoist schools, which are very, very predicated on oral teachings. And there's some which are more predicated on literary teachings. I happen to be on the literary end of things, but what I would say is that um, in meditation, we shouldn't view it as something which is orthodox in nature. So when you read the documents, you have to keep in mind that these are experiments that people did on themselves. So, you know, somebody said, well, if I meditate in this certain way, what will happen? And so the people who were successful, who were able to produce successful students, their books ended up becoming canonical. Whereas the people who weren't successful, who went crazy, who drove their students crazy and probably drove their wives crazy, um, they, they didn't become as can- canonical. So the the idea is that when we, we read these things, it's very useful to think, okay, these things are standard for a reason because they, they work. But at the same time, each of us has a very unique physiology. We have very unique temperament. And so typically the way that I like to read personally is rather than associating myself with you know one text or one, one branch, I like to read really broadly and try to understand, number one, what the tradition is as a a generalized idea, and then number two, the specifics of each of the different authors and what they were bringing to the table in terms of practice. Because the the main problem with meditation, uh, other than just having the basic knowledge, is solving problems. So when you meditate, once you get to a, a new level, then you're going to be confronted with certain challenges. Um, which are related to to how you practice, how you how you use your mind, um, you know how you live in society while trying to be good at being peaceful, and all of those different problems um, are partially answered by documents, but a lot of them you also have to find your own solutions to, and so not only should you read, but you should read in a dynamic way. Um, the problem is that understanding where the boundaries are. Is, is really difficult. So like, is, is, let's say Taoism has um, five major meditation traditions and they're all really different, right? So visualization and sitting in apophysis and, uh, and doing alchemy and doing breathing work 
and doing stretching are all completely different ideas. And they have some synthesis, but they're not exactly the same thing. So then you have to understand where the actual boundaries are when you read. So I would say that reading is extremely important, but how far you want to go down the rabbit hole is another question. The, the major concern that I have is that there's a couple types of people in the environment of Taoism that are not very conducive to a productive discussion. So one type of person is a person who does a lot of reading, but they don't make sense of it. And so it ends up being a mishmash, or my, my friend Josh Painter calls it um, uh, buffet-style Taoism. So you go to the buffet and you just take a little bit of this and a little bit of that without any context. So that, that kind of study is not very productive. The other kind of study that can be a problem is you have a good teacher and you have an oral transmission, but you haven't looked into the intellectual side of it. That's really dangerous because, you know, that's when you start seeing people getting their own ideas and the, before they're ready to have their own ideas and putting, you know, a little Vajrayana together with a little Taoism, yeah. you know, with a little bit of Christian mysticism. And what you end up is just with a, a wild mess. So, you know, um, you have to find a way to streamline yourself, but that's really difficult. That's where the, there's a very subtle thing. Yeah. I think that's why we need good, sincere, honest teachers that you have a good, sincere, honest relationship with, not just somebody in a class, right? Um, you know, and, and that's really the important of the, the Sifu disciple or the Guru disciple relationship is, is helping through that and, and that guidance. And I think it's very important to understand history and tradition and culture, especially as an outsider of that culture, when you're doing the practices to kind of root them in something. You know, a lot of martial artists don't agree with me that I traveled all through Asia to six or seven countries to study in those countries and learn in those countries the healing traditions and the martial arts traditions because I got a better understanding and a sense of time and place and and center for my own understanding of those by doing it there. Whether or not it's the same techniques or not is uh, really irrelevant to that exercise. Um, we talked about, the, you, you had mentioned about the Dantian, and I, I think that's an important area to talk about. Uh, in Qigong, uh, in Tai Chi, we talk about it in, you know, two fingers width or so below the navel, the elixir field, the place where the energy is uh, gathered. And you're, uh, you're saying that in the Taoist arts, uh, as opposed to the Chinese arts, the, Dao, the Dantian, excuse me, has a different um, meaning or use. Can, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So when we do, let's start with uh, martial arts. So yeah. when we do martial arts, what we call Dantian is really something like the center of balance or, or the center of gravity in the body. Yeah. And so it's this area under the, uh, under the umbilicus. And when you, when you root in martial arts practice, one of the things that you can do is, you know, sort of sink into that area so that you're ready, right? You can think of like a tiger being ready to pounce. That's relaxation in the martial arts is kind of just being ready, isn't it? Yeah. And so we get rooted into this center space and there is a sense of energy there, right? It's not like there's no, no energy, but the energy is very much dedicated to doing the practice of martial arts. And so if you have things like, um, you know, let's say uh, something resembling a, kun I'll use Kundalini as an example, just because it's the easiest way to talk to a broad audience. Let's say you have something approximating a Kundalini experience when you practice martial arts. That's, um, that's good. It can be a positive experience, but you wouldn't make the mistake of saying that martial arts are the same as Kundalini either. Um, and so when you look at the way that the different arts contextualize the, the Dantian area, the martial arts are looking at it as the center of all of the movement. It's like a hub around which everything moves. Yeah. Qigong practice looks at the Dantian as um, a major conduit and storage place for energy. But when we circulate energy in Qigong practice, usually it will be either through physical movement or through mental activity. Right. So right. you can do Qigong has two major standard versions of practice, right? One is called Jinggong, which means stillness practice. And one is called Donggong, which means movement practice. And so you could sit in a meditative posture while doing Qigong, but usually it involves some sort of activity of the mind. And so like somehow leading the qi or stimulating it so that you, you bring it around the body and then you bring it back to store in the Dantian. But it's not that common for Qigong people to spend a lot of time in absolute stillness and absolute apophysis, right? Like absolute 
uh, forgetting the self. So meditation is really geared toward that extreme of stillness. The idea of Qigong and martial arts in terms of qi is you go from movement to stillness, but in meditation, you go from stillness to movement. And so when you think of the Dantian from the Taoist perspective, the idea is that this is a part of the body which contains some genetic information. That's the, that's the sort of typical idea that um, when, when we were created as human beings, right, we came together as a result of the merging of sexual material from our parents. And our parents had their own ancestors, and those ancestors go all the way back to the beginning of life on Earth. And the beginning of life on Earth is linearly connected to the beginning of the, the universe, right? So there's this original creative moment in the universe, which is, you know, we think, we think it's the Big Bang in, in modern science. Um, and that creation, precip all the stuff that happened precipitated from that. But when we were born, it's kind of like the same thing, and no pun intended with the Big Bang. But, um, but you know, the idea is that this, this material comes together, like the sexual materials, it's sort of like these gases circulating in the pre-universe, right? And so when we talk about generating energy from a Taoist perspective, we're looking at it from, from that perspective. So the belief is that you can go back to the precondition of life by entering into this state where you focus on this Dantian area, but then you you allow yourself to gradually enter into meditative stability and um, then self-forgetting. And the self-forgetting is where the energy gets stimulated, and then it can move strongly from that point. So that's the first function of the Dantian from a, from a Taoist perspective, um, actually generating the, the original energy that creates life. The second thing is that the energy tends to move around the body, up the back, to the head, and down the front. And so the idea is that by moving, by it moving spontaneously up the back, it goes to the brain and it nurtures the brain. And they call it bunao, right? Repairing the brain. And basically, um, it can relieve a lot of sort of nervous system issues that, that you can have, that you develop. And it's sort of like, um, let's say almost everybody has some really mild, um, you know, chronic illness is related to the way that their nervous systems are aligned because they're stressed out and they're tired. And so after that happens, then the chi, it comes back to the dantian. Usually we will swallow our saliva and bring it back to the dantian and then store it behind the belly button. And then at that time, the dantian acts as a storage center. So when we say dan in, in internal alchemy thinking, what we mean, uh, dan, it means, it technically means cinnabar but we use it to mean uh, a medicine, basically, that's congealed from this chi that we have, that we've circulated in our bodies, that we bring back to this point behind the umbilicus. And so then that energy uh, congeals over time and it becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. And eventually it becomes so big that it can move freely up and down the body or even outside of the body. And so when we think of that um, concept, dan tian or elixir field, it doesn't necessarily just mean the lower abdomen or the head or the chest. It could be anywhere where that congealed energy is. Um, and once it gets strong enough, then you can control it. And so basically the, the high level concept in, in internal alchemy is that you want to be able to use this elixir to modify your energy appropriately to what's happening in your life. Um, so that let's say, you were really tired, well, you have a reserve of energy that you can tap into that'll make you less tired. Or, you know, um, let's say you're, you're getting older, which is inevitable. Well, you can slow down some aspects of the aging process just by having more abundant energy, um, which is based on something that's really innate. So, whereas, you know, in martial arts, we might say, we mainly think of energy in the function of self-defense or, or cultivating health through movement. In Qigong, we think of energy through the perspective of cultivating health through movement. But in Taoism, we think of cultivating energy from the perspective of doing something which is the, the most essential level of existence, is, is stillness and non-being. And all of our consciousness, all of our energy precipitates from that. So we want to create that, and then we want to keep it. So the Dantian, in, from that perspective, is um, this creative place in the body and in the mind, and then how we store it. So it's a, it's a more, um, in my opinion, the idea of Dantian in, Dao, in Taoism is a lot more um, 
nuanced than a lot of other practices. So when we talk about the microcosmic orbit, this kind of circulating through the body, um, most people, I think, practitioners starting to, to practice that, uh, use visualization, mental visualization to imagine that there's some chi in the body and the dantian that you have to then move up your spine and then move down the front and circulate and circulate. In your, in your experience, does that need to happen or is it sitting in stillness, quiet sitting, meditation, enough that it would just move on its own when it's... Yeah, so, you know, it's, it's interesting. I, I'll, I'll give you two answers. One will be short and one will be a little bit longer. So um, you can definitely activate the small heavenly orbit just by meditating and, and keeping your breath and your attention in your lower abdomen. Um, there's a, a process. And the process basically is that you need to attain stability so that your mind doesn't run away but you also need to not fall asleep so usually we call that process timing the fire mm. so the fire refers to the fire of your spirit right and so you use your attention to illuminate that area and you enter stability but once you become stable you have to actually enter into meditation and forget yourself and then after doing that for some reason something gets activated down there and, you know, it could be hormones, it could be related to the, the parasympathetic nervous system, or it could be some combination thereof. But something happens that can cause the energy to move up the spine to the head. Um, so that's the, that's the simple answer. The more complicated answer is that this idea of circulating the energy with the mind um, in Taoism is a major taboo. So it's called kong zhuan he chu. Um, empty circulation of, of the microcosmic orbit. The reason they say empty is because there's no energy there. It's just the mind moving. So from the Taoist perspective, it's a taboo. But that doesn't mean that it's necessarily wrong. So in the 20th century, maybe even as early as the 17th century, people in the Chinese medicine world were starting to experiment with different ways that you could move the qi up the back through the use of different breathing practices or through the use of different types of visualization. And those are outside of the internal alchemy tradition. It's a different way of viewing it, but they have a lot of utility for health maintenance. So um, one of the systems I can think of in the 20th century that dealt with this problem really well is called Jen Qi Yun Xing Fa. So the um, Jen Qi means true Qi, Yun Xing means circulation and fa means method. So the circulation method of true qi, um, which was um, a mid 20th century qigong system where you sit in meditation, but you stimulate the movement of the qi by focusing first on the chest and then on the abdomen and the breath. And then gradually by allowing that really small amount of movement to happen, the qi gets stimulated in the back and moves up the head. Um, and so it's not the same as internal alchemy but it has a different idea. So from the Taoist perspective, one of the things we're trying to do is reveal our original nature, right? So what our mind is when there's no thoughts happening and what our mind is when there's no intention happening. Well, you don't get to go into a no thought environment by thinking, and you don't get to go into a no intention environment by intending. So any intention or thought that we use in practice is usually used just as a way to get the mind to become stable. Um, but the benefit there is a, it's a longer term benefit and it's spiritual, right? It's self revealing. Whereas if you want to do it for only for health purposes, it might be better to use one of these other methods where, you know, you actively move the energy around because if you do it properly and you, you don't make mistakes, then it can be very good for your body. Um, so I would say that neither way is wrong, but you should, you should contextualize your practice and, and, have a goal and then whatever your goal is follow the goal and try to do it as best you can i heard from somebody um another guest who said that actually his opinion now in his 80s is that um we don't have there's there's no inherent dantian there we actually have to create the dantian through internal alchemy first so that you ha you have to create this cauldron to hold the energy so no amount of regular qigong is going to do anything if you don't first create the container with, you know, in which to hold the energy. Uh, and that seems to be a little in contrast to most of the books that say it's automatically there. And, you know, you've got your prenatal chi and your postnatal chi and it's all collecting and et cetera. What is your um, outlook on that? 
Well, you know, um, one of the ways that, that I think about these things is I want to um, be fair to everybody and include everybody to the extent that they're all that they're good actors. So, you know, if people are doing things that are bad, I don't want to include them. But anybody who's doing something that's good and helpful, I'd like to include them and, and not have to be exclusionary because of my preferred practices. But um, I would say that from an internal alchemy perspective, then um, your, your guest is completely right. Um, when you practice um, seated meditation or, you know, Neda and internal alchemy, right? Um, at the start, you don't have any dantian to speak of. You just have an abdomen. Right. And so they have words to to describe that, right? They use the word um, uh, kundu, right? The earth, the earth uh, burner, or tufu, right? The earth, uh, earth cauldron, um, rather than the word dantian. And so uh, the other thing, though, is that dantian from the Taoist perspective is not just in the abdomen; it's really anywhere in the universe where there's energy. Mm. So um, the dantian is like um, is like an energetic field that can exist anywhere but we think of our bodies as being our dantian right so you can sort of think of it in i used to think of it kind of as being like a battery but i'm not sure even that's completely accurate um i'd say from the taoist perspective that your your, your guest is right from the qigong perspective or from the martial arts perspective maybe it, it may be a, a slightly different application of the concept and so if we want to be really fussy, we can say, well, Dantian is a Taoist concept, right? It originally, the first mention of Dantian comes from um, a document. It's not a document. It was a stele. It's called the Laozi Ming, right? The, the stele of Laozi. And um, that dates back to, you know, like 86 BC or something like that. And on it, it, it has this whole discussion about, you know, different things associated with the Tao. And it says the Dantian is a great purple room, right? So, well, what does that mean? So they hadn't defined it as like, where is it in the body? And if you look at old Taoist documents, one of the things you'll see is that the Dantian can be in quite a lot of different places. So it was only later that people like Go Hong, um, they standardized it into being one in the head, one in the chest and one in the abdomen. But even some people in the internal alchemy tradition, they don't like the idea that the dan middle dantian is in the chest. They say it's in the upper abdomen. Right. So, right. you know, these these terms, they're really, uh, I would say that the easiest way to understand them is tens of thousands of people have done science experiments on their own bodies over time. Yeah. And they all have different ideas based on their experiences. So I'd like to talk about these things in a standard way. But if I do talk about them in a standard way, then I have to actually, um, from my learning and from the learning of other people around me, I have to coalesce a standard because there isn't one that's consistent. Right. Whereas in modern Qigong culture or in modern martial arts, the standard is much, much better than in Taoism. For sure. Another one of my guests likened the, he said, there's no Dantian. Your, your body is like uh, a lithium battery. It's all or nothing. You either have the energy or you don't have energy, and it permeates the entire body because all the cells and the and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that seems reasonable as well, especially if you think of the whole body as a Dante and not just three locations. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, the the thing is that um, yeah, and the Dante could even be outside the body if you you know depending on your practice. But one of the things to um, consider is that. Not everybody has developed this energy, of course. If if right. they had, then we wouldn't be talking about this. But um, but on the other hand, everybody has the basic material that they need to be able to cultivate it. So that's the you know the important thing in Taoism. Taoism has a very hopeful message for humanity, which is that every single one of us comes from the same origin, and so every single one of us is united by this really essential, wonderful energy that created life. And so we can all tap into it. Yeah. And so I would say that, you know, to put a positive spin on the statement that you either have it or you don't have it, that's the that's the cultivated, developed energy, but the basis of the energy everybody has. You talked about uh, the Nadon traditions and probably, what, seven, five, seven, you know, distinct traditions. Can you talk about those a bit? Or yeah, so I count them at seven. seven. Um, there's the best scholar on Nadan in China right now is named Hu Fu Chen. 
Um, I think he counts a slightly more than seven traditions, but some of the traditions he counts um, are have overlap within other traditions, and some of them don't have any extant documents. So mm. we, we don't we don't know about them much other than perhaps stories or archaeology. But I would say there's seven major Nadan traditions, and if we look at them historically. Um, they all come from one source. So the source is from a person named Lu Dongbin. Um, Lu Dongbin was a, a, let's say, a low-level government official and scholar during the Tang Dynasty, uh, I think in the 800s. And his story basically is that he he had this very, very, you know, convoluted dream where he became a became the equivalent of, uh, let's say, the equivalent of Bill Gates. But then he ended up getting betrayed and he, he, he was lying, dying on the street. And he, and he woke up and the immortal uh, Han Zhongli was there and said to him, you see, so chasing after fame and fortune isn't, isn't really all it's cracked up to be. Come to, the, come to a cave with me and I'll teach you meditation. And so, um, you know, that, that he, he probably just figured it out by himself. But um, anyway, so he wrote a couple of poems about meditation and there was a 300, a two or 300 year period where people were trying to figure out what they meant. And so there was this second, there's this other tradition called Jin Dan Da Dao. Jin Dan means golden elixir, Da Dao means great way. And so there was a period of time where people were trying to figure out what Lu Dongbin was saying. And they put all these other old Taoist practices together. So you get um, texts like Ling Bao Bifa, which is like a, a compendium of Taoist Qigong practices that are supposed to lead toward the golden elixir being developed. But when the tradition really took off, and what I take to be the first internal alchemy tradition, um, it was created by a person named Zhang Boduan. Uh, Zhang Boduan was, uh, I think, alive in the in the ten hundreds, um, and he wrote a document called Understanding Reality and another document called uh, 400 Characters of on the Golden Elixir. Mm -hmm. And so his school, we usually call the Southern School. Um, and it's based on um, what they say, Xian Liao, Ming Hou Liao Xing. So first achieving um, innate life energy and later realizing the, the innate nature of the mind. Um, so his school was popular for, for a few hundred years, and there was a whole sort of group of people that were practicing things that were associated with him. There's, I think, seven major people in that tradition. Um, but then it died away, and it was replaced by another school um, founded by a person named Wang Chongyang, uh, which is called the Northern School. So Wang Chongyang started the what's called the Complete, Re Complete Reality, the Chuanzhen sect, of Taoism, which is a renunciate sect. So basically he thought that in order to really attain the, the goal of internal alchemy, which is, they say it's immortality, it's sort of the Taoist equivalent of enlightenment. And he thought that you had to renounce your life as a, as a regular person, and you should go into seclusion um, and not engage with any of the filth of society. So they really emphasized um, stillness and, and clarity. So they took the opposite perspective of Zhang Boduan. Rather than cultivating qi first, they cultivated the mind first, and then the qi part came after. Um, the, then every other tradition of internal alchemy is some combination of those two. So there's the middle school, which was founded by Li Dao Chun um, in the 13th century. Uh, there's the um, eastern school, which was founded by a person named Lu Xixing. Lu Xixing was a secular practitioner, and he did um, he did Taoist sexual practices, so he couldn't become a monk, and so his school is seen as different from from the northern school um, because of this, you know, him staying in society. Basically, uh, the western school was founded by a person in the nineteenth century named Li Han Shu. Um, it's very very similar to to, to the eastern school. Um, the Jiang San Feng school, we talked about Jiang San Feng before, it came along maybe like a hundred years after the, maybe, I don't know exactly when, but it came along after the Southern school. Um, and I, either before or after the Northern school, I have to look into it. Um, but it, it's pretty similar to, to, to the Southern school in a lot of respects. Um, and, uh, then I think the other major school is called the Wulio school. So the Wulio school is an amalgamation of Taoism and Buddhism, so it imports a lot of ideas from from uh, Chinese Tao, uh, from Chinese Buddhism, and so basically, if you had to typify the schools, basically, 
there's um, three major worldviews. One worldview is you practice chi first. The other one is you practice uh, awareness first. And then the third one is that you combine the two. Uh, then in terms of practice, um, there's a few there's a few types of practice. So one type of practice, you start by focusing on the lower dantian. The other type, you focus between the eyes. And then in the third practice, you focus on the lower dantian, but you really emphasize stillness. So basically, if you had to make a broad generalization of nadan practices, those are the basic gates of practice. Either you're focusing in the lower body or in the head, and then you know there can be different things associated with them from you know going from there but is, is it mostly that the role in the jingong uh category of just being still right you're not trying to circulate something at the early stage or imagine visualize something would that be correct or no you know that is a, that's an interesting question so as a general rule if we say um by making a really direct reading of the documents that's correct but uh, there's another sort of deeper layer to it, which is that all of these schools have these things called kojue. Kojue means um, oral formula. Mm -hmm. And so let's say that you have uh, a document, but it's in a certain tradition, but you don't have a teacher. Um, when you meet the teacher who understands that document, they're going to give you oral formulas. And the oral formulas are going to tell you sort of things about how to practice that are hidden inside of the document. And so um, I'll give you an example. Before I ever did internal alchemy, um, I pestered my teacher for years to teach me Taoism. And uh, he would, ah, this isn't good for you. This isn't good for you, whatever. But then, you know, eventually I just tried to do it by myself and I ended up giving myself some problems. And so he took pity on me. And the first thing that he taught me was to imagine a purple cloud above my head that came into my body, all through my body, you know, down to my feet, basically. Um, and that opened up the energy channels and it actually caused the energy circulation to begin. And then after that, he started teaching me internal alchemy. So that's an example of using a, a, a technique outside of alchemy to start the process. Yeah. And that's very, very common. But the thing is that you have to be clear that the supplementary techniques are only meant to activate certain things for a short period of time. And then after that, you can stop practicing them and go into a more pure meditation the other thing is you could meditate just starting from a very pure place it's just that it's more difficult so sometimes people will have certain practices to open certain energy channels first mm -hmm. it's like where do you enter the Tao from where you are right yeah uh, and we think of those things as like jumper cables you know you need the jumper cable to start your car but once it's started you take the cables off and yeah you go on and move yeah i make the joke with people that it's kind of like getting a like a reiki attunement Right. In a certain sense, right? You go, you have the, they dangle the rocks over your head. And see, the thing is, though, I think that when Reiki originated in Japan, the, the person who founded Reiki exactly. probably had knowledge of Taoism. Yeah. Because that, that idea of doing something where you attune the top of the head energetically in order to get energy in the rest of the body, this is a very, very Taoist idea. Yeah. Not only that, but making the, 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 the characters with your hands, you know. And, oh, yeah, like a mudra. The mudras is uh, is all part of that as well, you know. In terms of Taoist Qigong and Buddhist Qigong, do you, is is there really much of a difference? I mean, you know, that's an interesting. This this is a very cool thing that I wish more people would talk about. So, um, when we use the term Qigong, the first thing that I have to say is the term Qigong is is a is a I don't want to say it's a problematic term, but it's a term that we have to understand in order to be able to really talk about it in in detail. So the idea of Qigong as a discrete set of practices was something that originated, let's say its genesis was probably around 1920, but it originated as a movement in the 1950s in, in mainland China because of uh, the Chinese government deciding to adopt these, um, you know, often very eclectic practices to promote public health. And so when we use the term Qigong to apply to Buddhism or Taoism, we're using it actually um, sort of in a post hoc or, or a retro retroactive way. Um, and the reason why we use that term usually is because the old practices have all these different names. Like in Taoism, you have Dao Yin, um, Nei Dan, 
you know, cun, cun xiang, these different, all these different terms that mean different things. But if we took them all together as, as one broader sort of cultural system, we could use a word to define them, which we would call qigong. Um, now, a lot of people who practice Taoism in contemporary times prefer the word xiu dao, but I use qigong personally as the, as the, as the phrase that I use. Um, but then when we talk about Taoist and Buddhist qigong practices, what we're talking about is a very diverse and eclectic set of practices within both traditions. So in, in some cases, they're very similar. Um, as an example, uh, the, the Tian Tai Buddhist tradition, which is famous for the Zhiguan school of meditation, Zhiguan means um, stopping and observing. Uh, they have Qigong practices which are based on doing um, you know, six different sounds, right? which in modern times we call six healing sounds. Um, which are from, from the Taoist tradition, actually. They were talked about by Tao Hong Jing and Sun Sun Miao before the Buddhist tradition ever got them. But on the other hand, if you look at Vajrayana Buddhism that entered China from, from Tibet or from Nepal, uh, that genre of Buddhism, their practices that we would call Qigong, right? their visualization practices, um, you almost never see in Taoism until much, much later when the Taoists take some of them and incorporate them into some of their practices. So it, when we look at different Qigong practices, probably the best way to do it is, again, to make, um, to make an analysis by history and by individual traditions. And then we can say some of them are very, very similar, and some of them are radically different. And there's a lot of Buddhist documents like, you know, Imagine that you get an incision made from your left heel and it cuts up your leg and exposes your muscle and bone. And then under your bone, there's marrow. And under the marrow, there's nothingness. You would never see that in Taoism. So, you know, it, it's, a, it's a complex field. But um, the way that I, so I have my own vision of how to, to view these things, which is based on modern research. It's not just my opinion. It's based on Hu Fu Chen's research and also the, the research of Chen Ying Ning, who was one of the major Taoist figures in the 20th century. Um, my view is that basically you have the following faculties that you can use for meditative practice. You can use your mind. You can use your breath. You can use uh, intention. You can use visualization. Uh, you can use internal stillness. Um, and you can use some sort of movement, but beyond that, um, how many other faculties can you, you know, you only have, how many senses do we have? Like maybe some people say five senses, some people say six senses. Um, but beyond those senses, uh, kind of our, our mind is the only game in town, right? So if I, um, I don't see any problem if I practice Taoist arts by doing, let's say the, um, you know, on Om Mani Padme Hum, this kind of mantra, um, one of the Taoist books I work with uh, called Xingming Guizhu actually has that mantra. And on the Om, you imagine uh, a Buddha made of pure white light inside of your umbilicus. And on the on the Ma, you imagine, um, you know, the uh, a Buddha made of blue light and then, you know, going around in the different colors. And when you get to the throat, you imagine the golden badra in your throat. There's the colors right above me. <laughs> ah, yes, exactly. Yeah. And so, so you know, like that's that's obviously like a Nepalese or Tibetan Buddhist tradition that made it into Taoism. Um, I don't see any right. conflict there at all. But the way that we practice it is a very Taoist way of practicing it. So um, when you look at these old traditions, it's very important to recognize that the people who, who created them were highly eclectic, uh, often very open to collaboration with, with different groups. We have thousands of years of documentation of the practices, but when we, we have such a long history, a large canon of information, millions of people having practiced these things over you know, countless generations, there are quite a few people today who say cheat is not real. Well, you know, the thing is the the, the very first thing is understanding that the way that we use language is culturally subjective. And so when we use a word like qi, um, there was, I think, to be fair to the, to the people who are uh, critical of it as a concept, when the idea of qi came to Western countries, we thought of it as a thing. Right. Um, you know, qi is a substance. But the reality is that that's never been a claim that was made um, in any generation of Chinese medicine or Taoism, um, 
when you look at the idea of cheap, the best way to think of it is as a, as a category. And it describes multiple real you know, instances of things that happen. So multiple real phenomena. And then if you look at it that way, then if you go into try to understand what the word chi means and then what it means when it's applied with different prefixes, then you can understand better what this actually is. And you can make a more reasonable argument that people will be able to accept. So I'll give you an example. This is the, this is the most basic one. Um, the, the character chi originally wasn't written in the way that it is today. It was written as three lines. It almost looks like the Chinese number three. And it was used to describe smoke or steam that comes off of a fire. And so when you see smoke or steam rising up into the sky, right, this is a, it's a tangible gas um, with different, you know, variations of um, liquid material or different molecules in it, but it's visible. That's the key point, right? And so eventually that became associated with clouds. So one of the first ways to discuss qi was actually there's two characters. One is called yin and the other is called yun. Yin has the character for qi on top and then inside of it is a character which means cause, like the cause and effect cause. The other character, yun, is the character for qi, and inside of it has a character called pronounced wen, which means to warm. So yin yun means condens condensation and evaporation. Mm. So when you look at the environment every day, right, the sun, uh, it shines on water on the earth, and some of the water evaporates and it goes up to the sky and it forms clouds. And then those clouds eventually also, they, they come down as rain. And so that's, you know, the, the water table works like that. It's also why in Genesis, they say that water is partitioned into the water above and the water below, oh. right? So these are things that ancient people understood through uh, objective and uh, empirical methods of, of analysis. Uh, so when people observed that, they also knew, right, you breathe. And when you breathe, you're breathing in air from outside. Well, the air outside is inexorably connected to the gases in the environment, which we already know are, are related to things like evaporation and condensation, and more importantly, the flow of, of air in the environment, right? So when you breathe in, you're breathing the chi from outside into your body, it goes into your bloodstream, right? These people were not stupid at all. If you yeah. read the, the Neijing, the, the uh, internal classic, which is the main compendium of acupuncture in Chinese medicine, um, what you'll see is that they really understood circulation. So they knew that when you breathe in, you bring clean air into your body, it enters into your bloodstream, and the blood goes around and it nourishes all of the tissues in your body, and then it is returned back via the, the veins to be breathed back out into the environment. So then you, you, you know, aspirate or you exhale the, the turbid or the dirty chi back into the environment. These things are, are scientific concepts. But the issue is that Chinese thought, especially traditional Chinese thought, is holistic in nature. And modern Western thought since the time of Descartes is uh, highly based on tearing things apart into their smallest sort of size. Redu it's very reductive, right? And so the thing is that if you look at our own history in the West, until the, until the Renaissance, our worldview was also extremely holistic. And we had many, many similar ideas in our civilizations. So what you're seeing is a, a culturally preserved foundation of the way that people used to think. It's not wrong. Um, I personally, outside of, outside of Taoism, one of my great interests is Unani medicine, which is the Greco-Arabic Greco medicine tradition preserved in India. And the reason I'm interested in it is because it's the last remaining variation of what we used to practice in the West. When you look at it, it's, it's different from Chinese medicine, but it's very, very similar because it's based on the same idea that nature changes according to time, season, weather, the relative heat and moisture in the environment, cold, damp, etc. right? Uh, all of those things have an outsized impact on the body. It's just that we have interior heating and air conditioning now, and our houses can be as dry or as moist as we want them to be. But, you know, look at somebody whose house has mold problems, right. and you can find out what is it about dampness that hurts people, right? So if we want to look at these ideas of qi, before we get into a discussion 
of identifying you know individual points or, or meridians and stuff like that it's really useful to give people a little guided tour of of the rationale of it because there are things that just describe nature it's not meant to be it's not meant to be something you can put under the microscope because it describes so many different things it's like saying you know it's like saying movement isn't verifiable because it's not a ball that's moving well, sun rays you can't put under a microscope and capture, but they're there. Yeah. Yeah. You can't see yeah, electricity, so but you can feel it and see its effects. And I look at Chi kind of the same conceptual description as you, you can't see it, but you feel it <laughs> and see its effects. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'll give you an example that I think is another useful example. Um, my teacher, I hope he'll be okay with me telling this story, but he said that when he was studying... Um, with with Yang Meijun, who was the founder of White Crane Qigong, um, that sometimes when the students would be in the room with her, the room would spontaneously smell like flowers. Mm -hmm. And so he asked one of the students, why does this happen? Because, you know, it was China in the 80s. They didn't have perfume. And uh, the student said, oh, that's from her body. It produces the elixir fragrance. Well, why? Right? Because that seems magic. But he said, hey, look, I bet there's a rational explanation for it. If you look at horses or you look at other types of animals, they can smell what each other's moods are like, right? Animals have to be able, many animals have to be able to actually smell each other's mood. Um, humans don't do that or probably because we, you know, um, not to, not to, I don't want to get my career ruined here by invoking Terence McKenna, but Terence McKenna, you know, had this idea. He said, hey, maybe people were following an animals. They were following lions around eating rotten meat. Maybe that's why our sense of smell sucks, because we just didn't want to put up with the putrid scent. But many animals can actually smell what's going on with each other's bodies. We have hormones and pheromones. Yeah. It's just that our overall sense of smell is much weaker. So let's say that perhaps this teacher, she cultivated herself on a hormonal level strongly enough that it was palpable sometimes. So if you give that a mysterious explanation, then that's when it becomes impossible to study from the perspective of science and then that's when you get these guys that wear fedoras coming out and you know making fun of you but the reality is there's people that can do that and it's been recorded right and it's been recorded also by you know un unbiased observers from scientific backgrounds so there must be a reason for it but what we should do is try to find friends who can help us to research that reason yeah so i have a Two things to share there. One, a uh, very good friend of mine, uh, Michael Malazuski, who was one of our guests on, uh, is a psychologist. In the 1970s, he had a Shaktipat initiation with three gurus of the time who were first visiting and doing that here in the United States. And one was Swami Muktananda. And he said whenever he was in the presence of Muktananda while he was doing this practice, the entire room smelled like roses. It would just smell like roses. And then when he's done, the scent's gone. And one of my Qigong teachers, whom I wrote a book with, uh, Ho Fa Xiang, um, could make the room smell like flowers just as a demonstration. I, I want to move into, in, in the last segment here, about some very important work that you're doing. And this discussion has been extremely um, enlightening and, uh, and interesting. Yeah, brilliant. So um, I, I'm in a few different online spaces. Um, I like to compartmentalize things so they don't bleed into each other. A team of us, um, including myself, my teacher, and, and a couple of classmates, and also some people, unbiased people from outside of our organization, we, we started a nonprofit called Dao E. Dao E means Taoist Arts Organization International. Um, and the purpose of the, the project is to create a better understanding and promote the, the Taoist arts, which we consider to be um, self-cultivation practices associated with Taoism, um, the internal martial arts, uh, as well as Chinese medicine and Qigong. And so um, our idea is that by talking to experts in the field, we want to gradually understand what the different standards of each major tradition is, and from a very microscopic view, starting from lineage. So what we've been doing so far in order to get to that goal is that we've been interviewing people um, in the in the scene, you know, including, for instance, we had an interview uh, the other day, and uh, we're really looking forward to, to airing that one. Everybody in the organization really thought it was good. 
um, but we've also interviewed other people like uh, Livia Cohn, um, various martial arts figures. Um, Peter Ralston was one of the interviews that I did recently. Um, we've interviewed people in the Qigong world, uh, Mimi, Mimi Guo Dimer, um, who is based in England, a uh, very good Qigong teacher out of England we did recently. Um, and we're talking to these people in order to understand their, their practice, their view, their research, uh, and eventually we'll also start to talk to masters in, in mainland China, and Taiwan, and, and other places too. Um, and that's, you know, starting toward the goal of trying to understand and disseminate um, the major branches within these these arts that we practice. So, uh, you know, in the long term, the idea is that we want to be an organization where people can come to get accurate information about each lineage of practice. So let's say you do Yang style Taiji and you want to study the Yang style fast form, then hopefully we can have a master in China who's, you know, a, a lineage holder in that routine who can tell us about it so that if you wanted to learn about it, you could come learn who that person is through us, a little bit about their practice, and then be able to get in touch with them. That's sort of a long-term goal. Um, so that's Dao Yi. And then in terms of my own project, so my main project is called Immortality Study. Um, it's on Substack. So Substack is a publishing platform. It's, it's basically a newsletter. And um, it's, a, it's a secular Taoist meditation newsletter. And uh, basically, it it takes its name from um, a style of uh, Taoist practice called Xian Shui, which means immortality study, that was created by a person named Chen Ying Ning in the 20th century, um, who is who is my personal hero in Taoism because he's the person who made it possible for all of us to learn internal alchemy um, through through dedicated research uh, and and dissemination. And uh, what I do there is I. I do translations of various documents. So for the past few months, we've been working with uh, a text called um, Zhong and Lu Transmate the, the Golden Elixir, um, which is one of the major early formative texts that eventually helped create the internal alchemy tradition. So what I do there is I'll translate the text and then I'll write my own annotation of the text, either based on um, annotations that I read online or based on you know my personal knowledge from practice. Um, and so we're working through various different texts there, and sometimes I write opinion pieces and stuff like that. That's the that's the main place where I do most of my work. Um, associated with that, I also run classes every month. So um, what I'll do usually is people who read that that newsletter um, once a month or so, there will be an ad that basically has the the upcoming offerings. And what we do in the classes is we read various documents from Internal Alchemy in order to understand how the different traditions work. Uh, to get beginners started on their practice and to get intermediate students to be able to go farther in their practice. Um, the third thing I do, and this is really the other main thing, so anything else other than that is, you know, like a bit, a bit tangential, but the third thing I do is called Qigong Project. So um, it's a website, which is, you know, it's a Word, WordPress website. And um, what I'm trying to do is catalog the entire tradition of Qigong, which is a big drink of water, by the way. But basically the idea is that um, I've created different sections. So for Taoist Qigong practice, Buddhist Qigong practice, Chinese medicine, modern Qigong. And what I'm trying to do is give people uh, a historical and theoretical background that can allow them to understand how we got to where we are today. Because one of the things I've noticed about the Qigong world is that usually the way that teachers think about Qigong is from their own lineage perspective. So, you know, let's say you do one of the major Qigong lineages, uh, you're thinking from the perspective of what your teacher said and what your grand teacher said, and that's, that's good. But what it leads to is a silo effect inside of Qigong. And so it makes it hard to understand some of the more subtle things about the genre that are very important. Like, you know, how exactly we describe words like qi or dantian. This, this long conversation we had today, um, I would say that probably 99% of people in the Qigong world don't have any idea about anything outside of the tradition they do. So what I've done is I've, I've created a website where I'm gradually adding content that looks at these things from a historical perspective, but with an eye to talking about modern Qigong practice. So what I want to try to do is to say, how is it that we got to this place where we have, you know, 100 different styles of Qigong some of which are supported by the Chinese government, some of which are folk systems. 
but they didn't come out of nowhere and you know uh they they did come from somewhere so what the website is about is where they came from how their theory works and how their how the different ideas are, are different and how they coalesce together so qigong project is uh i anticipate in the future that i'll probably be putting more work into it than the than immortality study um although i expect both to you know continue having considerable output um i uh I somehow have fallen into the role of a, a writer. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> uh, also, something I wanted to mention is your passion for Chinese tea, because I've, oh. I've uh, years ago bought some really nice pu'er tea from you in a brick of some of some nature, and you're very uh, also involved in the tea culture. Uh, can you tell us a little about that, and if you have a website for that as well? Or... Yeah, well, that's that's great. I, I used I was in the tea industry for a decade, um, and uh, so when I first went to Shanghai, one of the biggest things I wanted to do was study tea tea ceremony. Um, my my teacher Yang Hai, he had always you know shared various teas with me. He's a he's a big tea connoisseur too. But um, I went to Shanghai and I wanted to study tea ceremony, so I, I, I looked around a lot. It wasn't hard to it was it was difficult to find you know, the genuine article at first, but I found a teacher who was uh, really, really knowledgeable and really generous with, with her teachings. And uh, so I studied especially oolong tea and poor tea with that teacher um, for uh, about three years. And I also frequently went to Taiwan during that time to, to research oolong tea and to research the pottery there. Um, I've been all over uh, South and, and Central China researching tea and pottery in those places too. Um, and I used to run a couple of different tea companies. So my first tea company, the Tea Kings, was was run with a guy named TJ Willia, uh, TJ Williamson, sorry, who was doing something very similar to what I was doing, but in Japan. And uh, I'm, I'm proud to say that our company won um, the North American Tea Championships back when it was called that. Um, the, tea, the Tea Kings won the first place prize category in baked and aged oolong tea in 2013. Uh, it might have been 14. And then the second year after that, um, my company, uh, Chayo Tea, won the same prize uh, in second place. So I've got two really beautiful right. ornate glass prizes, which I keep away from my cats. Right. Um, but uh, so I was in the tea industry for a long time, but I, I took a break from it to focus on Taoism. Yeah. Um, what I think will happen is that in the future, I've, I've been monitoring my social media, and it looks like the people who follow Qigong Project would like to know more about tea. So I think what I'll do, I have a YouTube channel just waiting to get filled up with tea videos. So I think that someday when I have a bit of free time, I might do some tea stuff. Wow. Um, so you can you can keep an eye out for it. And, and I did actually create a system of tea-based meditation or Qigong that takes ideas from internal alchemy and combines it with tea ceremony. Oh, wow. um, and we did we we did teach some classes about that um, to to a cohort a couple of years ago. So that might come back on the table. You never know. It, it depends on interest, and you know maybe some some wonderful person in California will sponsor me for a green card or something like that. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> then I can come teach tea in the in the land of tea in the land, which is California. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That sounds great. Well. Maybe, you know, when the time is right, we'll have you back on for a tea podcast because I'd oh, like to know cool. more about tea, tea cultivation, brewing, fermenting, you know, yeah. the, the rituals and, and the ceremonies and all of these things as well. It's so interesting. Do you know that um, the person, one of the people who created modern Chinese tea ceremony, um, his name is Zhou Yu, and uh, I met him in 2015. I had, a, I had an introduction to him from my teacher. And uh, we talked about the relationship between tea and meditation, and uh, they actually do like a, a version of internal alchemy that they do while they drink tea. It's very, very interesting. Well, I thank you very much, uh, Robert, for coming on out and uh, hanging out with me today for a while and, and sharing a lot of your history background insights and especially your very impressive um, knowledge of the history of Taoism and, and Qigong and Chinese culture and having the language to back it up and the readings. And uh, it's been a very nice conversation. I know our listeners will love it uh, as much as I did um, having the conversation with you live. 
Thanks, Mark. I really appreciate it. It, it was a blast. <laughs> Wonderful. I'll see you soon. So yeah, 